Yep. Yep. So the coded, uh, hold on a second. I need to mute my webinar here. <clears throat> Howdy, Doug. Yeah. <clears throat> How are we doing today? Not too bad. I like all the African de decor behind you. Have you been there or is that just a no. inspiration? Yeah, we've been there. Okay. Those are actually pictures we took. That's cool. Is that a painting in the frame or is that a picture as well? Um, that's actually a, that's actually a painting that my daughter did. Okay. That's cool. Did your whole family get to go or just you and your wife? Just me and my wife. Awesome. Dale is, should be joining us. He can tell the story how he almost got stuck in Africa before the virus hit. Yeah. What was, what was the highlight? Say someone was going there for the first time, what's something that they have to do? Boy, I don't know. I would have spent another week if we was doing it again. We did, we did two weeks and I wish we just went ahead and spent another, another week at least. Really? Across the whole country. There's a lot to see. Yep. What part of, I mean, where were you at? We were in South Africa for the most part. Okay. Yeah, we didn't we didn't get up north to any of that stuff. I would I would have done that if I was doing it again. We would have taken another week and went up there. So, was it just a vacation, or was there any work involved as well? Um, it was both. I did a week's worth of meetings, and then with Jill Clapperton, and then and then a week a week long hunting trip. Oh, uh, awesome! And I I would have done a I would have added a week of sightseeing to that if I yeah. was doing it. 
What were you able to hunt when you were there? Oh, we did Impala, a blessed buck, a Gims buck, a Kudu. Um, Is that all like one one hunt and you're just waiting to see yeah. what comes by or is it very specific towards what you're going after? Kind of both. I mean, they know different things are in different areas. Yep. So. That's cool. Yeah, it was a fun time. We really enjoyed it. You went to Africa too? Yep. How long ago? Oh man, that's that's been, been five years ago now. Okay. I'm ready to go back. <laughs> I'd give it a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Doug, was it cheaper just to get the picture of the giraffe and the rhino yeah. instead of actually having them taxidermied and brought back? Because I'm sure the, I'm sure you bagged those. Yeah, well, I didn't do a giraffe and a rhino. Those are a little out of my price range. <laughs> I had to, I had to beg, beg and plead my wife just to get what I what I did get. So, my my uncle has done several hunts over there, and he's pretty much shot everything you can shoot, and. Yeah. He said the giraffe was his least favorite. He said it was no fun to watch yeah. such a, yeah. a amazing creature go down. He's like, I, I didn't really care for it that much. Yeah. Oh. Noah, you should, uh, there, there's 20 people on. You should tell people how much rain you guys got at your house here in the last four days. Well, the weather weather reporter or whatever came out, and they, they said nine inches, but I know that's not true because I know on my rain gauge and my neighbors, it, we corroborated. We've got at least 11 inches uh, in the last four days. So I was taking – in fact, I was a little late to work. I had to take three – just three detours, but every road – that possibly gets me down south. I had to at least go through some water and around a couple, couple road close signs. But it's been our neighbor actually had to. He's about a two miles from us. Had to get rescued from a an airboat. Game and Parks had to come get him Sunday night, like three in the morning. That's crazy. If you see any good opportunities for pictures of contrast between cover crop fields and especially tilled fields without cover crops? So it's actually funny you say that. I I got home Friday afternoon, Friday night, and said hi to the wife. And I said, I got to go out. And she said, why? And I said, I have just, I got to go out. I got to go take pictures. And about 10 minutes later, I called her. I said, I'm in the ditch because I was trying to take pictures of comparison photos and she's like I told you not to go out and do that so I tried Dale it didn't go very well because I appreciate I, didn't I appreciate that effort so. <laughs> yeah it's been, been you, didn't crazy. Have the, you didn't have the drone there that you could just send out and uh, get the pictures I should I should bring the drone home tonight actually and get some because it we look like Minnesota, the amount of little lakes we've got. Unfortunately, they're all cornfields, so not so good for the farmers. Dale, was Mark Thomas still planning on joining? Well, uh, last I knew he was. I'll, go ahead and I'll resend him the, the link just in case he's having trouble getting on, but I'll, I'll shoot him a text too. Okay. Um, it is 5.30, so we're probably going to get started here. Um, thank you all for joining us. As always, uh, you guys are all should be muted, but we will take your questions in the chat or the Q&A portion. Uh, we're going to let Dale, Doug, and Mark go ahead and kind of give us a presentation, but we'll open it up to questions right around uh, 6.15. So if you have questions that are specific towards what they're talking about in the presentation, again, go ahead and type those out in the chat or in the Q&A portion. But we're gonna go ahead and get started here this week. We've got kind of a panelist as well as a presentation from Dale, but um, 
I want to welcome Doug Peterson here with us. He's been an NRCS employee for over 32 years. He started his career as a soil scientist, but is currently a regional soil health specialist for Missouri and Iowa, teaching NRCS staff and producers around the Midwest about soil health. Uh, he attended college at Missouri Western State University, graduating in 1986 with his um, bachelor's degree in agriculture with an emphasis in economics and agronomy. He grew up on a crop and livestock farm near Newtown in North, Northern Missouri. And today he operates a cow calf and contract grazing operation with his father, Steve. So currently they run about 250 cows and they utilize adaptive multi paddock grazing to deal with fescue, improve soil health, and eliminate the need for most purchased fertilizer and limited hay needs to about one bale per cow per winter. Doug's NRCS training coupled with his real world hands-on experience makes him a unique speaker that is relatable to both agency personnel and producers. So we're uh, uh, rather privileged to have him on here tonight with us. Uh, Mark Thomas should be joining us. We're working on getting him on board. He lives in Enid, Oklahoma and grew up in East Texas and graduated with his degree in agriculture from Louisiana Tech University. He spent the last 30 years in the seed industry which has given him the opportunity to travel to Europe, Australia, and Mexico within his profession. Today, he is the Director of Business Development for Mountain View Seeds, a division of Pratum Co-op in Salem Oregon, Salem, Oregon, and he is the current president of the Southern Seed Association, a regional trade association that covers 14 states. Along with other personal responsibilities to his family, he owns and operates a farm in Oklahoma with his wife where they produce seed and grass-fed beef. So hopefully we'll work on getting him in. Um, we also have Dale, many of you are familiar with him. He's done several of our webinars here that you guys can all watch. Those are on our website. Um, Dale, if you wanna introduce yourself, you can a little bit. Otherwise, I'll let you go ahead. Um, if you're able to share your screen, I think I got that available. If not, um, <laughs> might have to do a little work around, but see if you can share your screen and uh, kind of start. Uh, the says I cannot. Okay. Are you able to, why don't you go ahead and email that to me? Maybe I'll just go ahead and share. In the meantime, uh, Doug, why don't you just tell us kind of your experience with fescue pastures and uh, what you've seen in your area? Um, you, you bet. You know, there's, <clears throat> there's a, a lot of ways to to try and tackle the the fescue problem um you know i think it's going to take a and as that's what you're going to hear from dale you know i think it's going to take a a really a, a multifaceted approach um <clears throat> it's going to take um you know selecting livestock that are that are somewhat adapted to your environment um it's also going to take um you know managing the the fescue that you do have in in a lot of cases um you know, and then and then uh, converting some acres, and I think you'll hear about some of that tonight as well. So I think it's going to take all three of those things to really um, to really make it work. You know, I, I don't think, um, and I and I've tried all of those, and I, and, I, and I utilize all of those in our operation. You know, I think once we've got we've got fescue, um, I don't I don't think we'll ever be rid of it. Um, you know, even if you convert a field um, to to something else it's you've still got it in your fence rows you've still got it in your ditches you've still got it around your trees the livestock are going to move it around the cattle are going to move it around everywhere um over time so <clears throat> I, I think that i think that there's times to do all of those things i think for specific for specific classes of livestock you know uh, finishing animals um, breeding heifers i think that probably conversion is a good opportunity um but you know, I have a lot of rented acres um, and convincing a, a landowner to either give me a long enough lease or to um, have them spend the money to, to convert those acres from fescue to something else is going to be a pretty tough, tough sell. So on those areas, I think that's where um, just management um, and, and adapted animals are going to are really going to work the best. So, yeah, are you close yet? Dale, did you were you able to send that to me? It is uh, it is uploading as we speak. I've got about I'm probably eighty percent there. Okay, um, 
while we wait for that, I guess, Bill, I don't know how much <laughs> multitasking you can do, but maybe talk about the importance of why we're, we're tackling fescue tonight. Right. And, and the biggest reason is just simply the, the endophyte toxin. It, it's a blood vessel constrictor, makes the animal unable to, to get rid of body heat in the summertime. It um, makes it uh, so that you can't get, can't get body heat to extremities during the winter time. And I, I just sent that to you, Noah, so. Okay. I think, I think those, are, those are great, great points there, um, Dale. You know, there's no doubt it causes a lot of, a lot of issues, particularly with, with animals that, you know, are in a growing condition that need that extra blood flow for, for nutrient flow, for growth. Um, and so I think that's a, I think that's a big, I think that's a big reason to, to try to, uh, try to try to try to work through some of it, get rid of some of it, um, and select animals for it. Yeah, and uh, of course the biggest impact is on animal performance, and and yep. the biggest question on, in everybody's mind is if I spend the money to, uh, do something about this fescue, will that pay it back? Will that will I receive? how long before I get a payback on this? And from what I have seen, um, the economic loss on an acre of fescue in a cow-calf operation compared to a non-endophyte infected field, it's usually around $100 an acre. Would you say that's fairly accurate when you look at lowered calving percentage and lowered, lowered uh, animal performance over the course of a year? Well, I think it depends on the, the class of livestock, whether you're spring calving or fall calving, um, mm -hmm. whether you're, you're having animals that are adapted to it. Um, you know, talking about that, uh, ways to evaluate the economics of that, um, Missouri Natural Resources Conservation Service on their website actually has a, an Excel file that you can walk through and, and plug in your cost of conversion and, and plug in um, estimated uh, changes in conception rates and it will give you an estimated time of payback um, or if you're a stalker operator um, you can put in a different rate of gain and it will and it will give you an estimated t time of payback so that's a great tool that somebody can help to help somebody figure out that economic uh, turnover yeah and uh, you mentioned a, a very important strategy. One of the, the things that people, I think, overlook with fescue is that it, it's a cool season grass. It, it, it really, doesn't, um, really doesn't grow in the summertime anyhow. In the heat of summer, it really does not grow very well. Mm -hmm. And if, if you have, uh, people ask me if, if all I have is fescue. What can I do different? I think you mentioned one of the biggest changes is simply moving to a fall calving operation makes a lot of sense in fescue country. It uh, does. Yep. The, the toxicity of the fescue is highest during the seed head elongation, which you know is May, mid-May to mid-June basically is the most toxic time for that fescue and then the fescue stops growing. So for about two months, you get very limited growth on that fescue. So what they're eating is for the next two months in the hottest time of summer is the most toxic part of the plant. And, and it's also dormant and low nutritional quality at that time. It's, it's already seeded out. And so uh, summer pasture on fescue is, is really, um, really detrimental to animal performance. Even if it's endophyte free, it's not very good in the summer. Um, and, and one thing we'll talk about is, is incorporating more warm season forages into the rotation, uh, pasture rotation to help alleviate that. And, and we'll, we'll talk about that more as, as we move along here. Um, yeah, I did get it, I got it. So if you wanna go ahead and try sharing your screen now, I think you okay. should share that. So if you wanna start to. Will it be your screen or mine? You can share yours, that way you can control it from there, I think. 
Okay. Um, I'm not seeing it here. It's not here. I can go ahead and try. In the meantime, welcome, Mark. I gave through your your uh, introduction. Sorry, we were working on getting you a, a link for that. All right. Thank you. Yeah, I was uh, enjoying the comments and um, that you guys were sharing earlier. I mean, thing keep in mind is that uh, you know it's not fescue; it's uh, it's the toxic alkaloids in the endophyte, the ergovalin, that is about one step away from LSD. And so, as long as cattle are on that or grazing it, they're going to feel the effects. They're going to feel that uh, the vasoconstriction. So. And obviously, we're going to talk more about all those negative impacts and how that affects. But, you know, fescue as a, as a crop, as a grass, is actually uh, made Missouri the uh, beef cattle producer that it is. The truth is, is that if it wasn't such a good grass, um, you know, with the negative effects of toxic endophytes, um, you know, what a train wreck it would have been. Yeah. Dale, okay. I am sharing the screen, but you should be able to click. I don't know if you want to okay. try that, but uh, I tried to give you, we're dealing with some different technology this week. So Dale, you should be able to control that. Okay. Um, okay. Well, we've already talked a lot about what's wrong with fescue and it's essentially, I'm, it's not clicking for me, Noah. It says waiting for you to control your screen. I might just go ahead here and I'll control it. it might be a little clunky, but I think we can make it make it work. Okay. Yeah. And, and of course, the the reason, just like Mark said, for the poor animal performance, is the endophyte fungus. And go ahead and click Noah. And you can see the fungus right there in, in between the, in the, the plant vascular tissue there. And go ahead and click again. And it, it's, it's not just practical experience where we see this. Research has confirmed this. We all know that fescue endophyte has some real negative effects. This is just one trial down in Arkansas. 44% calving rate versus 80% 80, 80 on endophyte free fescue. And the, the weaning weights were 82 pounds less. And depending on your stocking rate and what the, the calves on each scenario weighed, you can tell there's a huge economic loss on, in this situation. Now, that doesn't mean you, you will experience the same economic loss if you have endophyte fescue. A lot of variables enter into this, but the bottom line is, is that endophyte fescue costs you money. Um, hey, Dale, I want to add that that, is a, uh, that was a spring calving um, trial. So, yes, and, and fall calving, and we'll talk about that a little later. We mentioned that a little bit earlier. Fall calving, much less detrimental to cap conception rates. And so, uh, next screen. And this is just more of the same thing. You tell that steer gains on toxic end fight were about half of what they were before. And, and part of that is compounded by, again, fescue is a cool season grass and just really does not grow well in the summertime. And so um, you might, and next screen. And fescue, like other cool season grasses, need additional nitrogen fertility for optimum growth. And one of the holes in the bucket of fescue landowners is that they have a hard time growing anything with the fescue uh, as far as legumes because of, of their grazing practices, some other factors, but we tend to get monoculture fescue. And then in order for it to produce, we have to fertilize it. Um, we'll talk about how to get around that as well. Next, next slide. 
And this just shows uh, the response of uh, cool season grasses to nitrogen. Uh, this is uh, perennial ryegrass, which is closely related to fescue. Uh, the far left uh, plot is zero pounds of nitrogen. Uh, the one to the right is 100. And then the third one is 200. And the fourth one is 300 pounds of nitrogen. And in case you uh, didn't know, nitrogen fertilizer makes grass grow. And uh, particularly cool season grasses, they need that extra nitrogen. Um, next slide. And this is just reiterating what I already said. Uh, smooth brome, uh, tall fescue have similar uh, growth response curves to, to nitrogen. And more nitrogen you put out there, the more growth you get. Uh, and it starts to plateau off, you know, 100 to, 100 to 150 pounds of nitrogen in our environment. Uh, next. Okay, so uh, why do we have so much fescue if it's so bad? It, it, Kentucky 31 fescue is still the most widely planted pasture grass in the United States. Why do we have so much fescue? Just keep clicking through these if you would, Noah. Um, one thing is, is it's tough. It, it survives our management. Um, it will handle overgrazing. Uh, it'll handle uh, drought when some other grasses like orchard grass won't. Uh, and even when we try to kill it, oftentimes it comes right back. And then, um, and for some purposes, fescue is the single best grass there is. But um, I think a lot of people have heard that, well, you can't ever get rid of fescue. Uh, it'll, in two years, it'll all be back the way it was. Some cases that's the case. In other cases, it's, I've seen conversions that were 100% effective with no return of fescue. Um, so it, it can be done, not every time, but often. And uh, we'll talk about some strategies and how you can manage to keep that endophyte fescue from reinfesting. Uh, let's go on to the next slide. The purpose for which fescue is just way better than everything else is winter pasture. If you stockpile fescue um, and, and allow it to accumulate growth for dedicated winter pasture use, there is no better grass. Uh, that stockpiled fescue, let's go on the next slide. Um, basically, to stockpile, you stop your grazing somewhere somewhere during midsummer, from uh, late July 1st to August 1st, somewhere in that time frame. Remove animals from the fescue, let it grow up, stockpile. If you give it a shot of nitrogen fertilizer sometime there in August, you can really increase the yield of that. But a lot of times stockpiled fescue in middle of January, February, even underneath snow, 14 to 16% protein and more digestible than good alfalfa hay. And like if we manage our fescue, we can have better winter feed than the hay we're paying through the nose to move to those cattle. That's where fescue really shines and no other grass really does it that well. Uh, next slide. So what do you do about fescue if you have endophyte fescue? Well, you can learn to manage it, to minimize the problems, or we can kill and replace it. And we'll discuss both options here, but we'll start with managing it. Um, and we talked about the peak toxicity. It's the toxicity is far worse in the summertime. The effects are far worse in the summertime than during other times of the year. And so simply finding alternative pasture sources to endophyte fescue in the summertime can eliminate most of the issues with fescue. Just using fescue in the cool part of the year, spring and fall or winter, eliminates most of the problems. And then we can dilute it or neutralize it. And next slide, and we'll talk about dilution first. Um, well, uh, keep just click on through these, Noah. We've already kind of covered this. And uh, as uh, summer breeding on fescue is particularly detrimental. But um, as far as management, 
I think I'll let Doug, uh, next slide here. Um, Doug, you want to talk a little bit about high density, non-selective grazing on these next three slides here? Well, it's just, it's um, using a, a very intensive grazing uh, management strategy, you know, um, helps, helps overcome the natural tendencies of the animals to, to be very selective. You know, if you, have a, if you have a pasture that has a fescue component to it and you allow a, a very lax continuous grazing method, um, the, the fescue will be the last thing that the animals eat every time you graze that pasture. And so if, if you have this very relaxed grazing scenario um, where, where they don't graze the fescue, um, it's gonna get more rest than anything else. And so over time, you will end up with a, a more fescue dominated uh, pasture. This non-selective that, that, he's, that he's got a picture of it here, basically what we're gonna do is require those animals to eat the fescue that's there along with all the other species of grass in that field. That way they, that way they, they don't show favoritism um, and the fescue doesn't get thicker and thicker. Um, there's another slide I think next here that, that is another example of that. Um, so this is actually a, a field of mine from several years ago. We took this field over and it was, it was a heavy fescue. It had some trefoil in it, which was kind of the redeeming uh, quality of this field. Um, it had a, a tremendous amount of ironweed in it as well. And so we came in, this was a set of uh, fall calving cows. So this was in July probably 60 days prior to calving. So we weren't right up against calving. So these animals had very low nutritional requirements. And so we came in and, and strip grazed across this field, um, making sure that all the fescue was grazed very uniformly as well as, um, next slide please, as well as the, the, uh, the ironweed in it. And so now as a result, you can see there that that was post grazing and that was a daily daily moves. It wasn't crazy high density like the like the first slide you saw, but um, basically we required them to eat um, all the fescue along with all the other beneficial plants. And so now many years later, and we don't have a picture of it in here, but now many years later, that field is really a very diverse field. Um, it's got orchard grass. I mean, it doesn't really have any natives in it yet. It was farmed for too many years, um, decades ago. But, but um, that's that's what we mean by using stock density. And I think it has to be in a fairly, fairly intensive manner to to help reduce that selectivity of those animals. It's a pretty fine line, Dale, between between reducing selectivity enough to get the forage grazed that you want but yet allowing enough selectivity so you get the animal performance that you want. And I think yeah. that's the tricky part. Yeah, and I think this actually works better with fall calving. You can do this in the summertime with dry cows and not have near the detrimental effect on, on you know, animal performance that you would have if there were milking cows during this. Right, but, but one, one thing I will, I will tell you um, is, is if, if you have, um, we, we have both the spring herd and the fall herd. And so that gives me two different groups of cattle at two different times of the year with a, with a lower or, or at least a different nutritional requirement to be mm -hmm. able to, to use that uh, reduced selectivity a little bit. Yeah. Uh, let's move on to the next slide, Noah. And hey, and so the first thing we're going to talk about as far as dilution is what else, what other plants can we get in? Now the grazing management can, can bring back some more diversity or you, you can seed some diversity in there, especially in the short term. Last summer, a lot of people had really churned up pastures, uh, really pugged up pastures because the, the, the pugging from hoof traffic during the really wet spring we had a year ago really tore pastures up we encouraged a lot of people to put teff grass out in those pastures uh, to increase their summer productivity. And that was really pretty effective. Another grass, next one that kind of, uh, the next slide will uh, look at crabgrass. And crabgrass, one of the differences between teff grass and crabgrass, they're both summer annual 
fine stemmed leafy grasses. Um, Teff grass usually will not reseed in a grazing situation. Crabgrass always seeds, in a, or almost always seeds, reseeds itself in a grazing situation. So depending on whether you want a one year fix or multiple year fix, Teff or crabgrass can both work. Um, and the next slide is uh, uh, putting in some large seeded animals, annuals. And this, this would involve uh, drilling, taking a drill out there. Uh, the crabgrass and teff both work fairly well broadcast. Uh, the, this slide, um, this is brome without any summer annuals in it. This was taken in September after a fairly rainy summer and you can see there's not a lot of growth out there. But the next slide will show you what it looks like where we drilled summer annuals out there. And we put a, a big uh, complex blend of summer annuals out there. There's sun hemp, there's cowpeas, there's pearl millet, there's sorghum, there's sunflowers, there's buckwheat, there's forage soybeans. Uh, the sun hemp, uh, the millet, and the forage and the uh, cowpeas seem to be the most uh, most successful at this. Now, in order for this to work, uh, you need, timing needs to work well. Um, you want to put it in late enough that the cool season grass is no longer competitive, and, but you want to put it in early enough that you're still getting your, your June rains. And in my experience, about the last half of June is when this works the best, and it doesn't work like this every year. Some years it's a complete failure, but when it does, you can imagine uh, how much feed you would have coming back into a field like this for fall grazing. This, this field did sit from when it was planted, uh, the broom was hayed off and this was drilled about June 20th. And uh, this picture was taken in mid-September and the cattle could be turned in there for a, a really high carrying capacity fall grazing. Now uh, the, the next slide shows some other strategies for uh, dealing with fescue toxicity. Um, just showing us what the dilution effects do. And uh, this was from Arkansas where they diluted fescue with Bermuda grass and increased gains of stalker steers. But fescue plus endophyte, it's dilution, not elimination of the toxicity. It's still there, but it's diluted. And it's really diluted about in exact percentage as what you're diluted. And uh, see, we got a question. Did the brome grass come back after the summer annuals were drilled into it? Yes, actually it grew better. Um, you probably noticed that brome grows better in October than it does in July, even though October has half the sunlight um, and usually lower rainfall than what July does. Uh, but brome grows better in October on less moisture and less sunlight because it's cooler. And by putting those summer annuals out there, you create a cooler microclimate and the cool season grass actually seems to grow better. And the hay yield the next year on that half of the field was 700 pounds an acre more hay than the field without the summer annuals the year before. Now, some of that was maybe due to increased vigor of the brome, maybe some of it was due to nitrogen fixation from the legumes or the higher amount of manure that that extra biomass created, whatever reason, it actually seemed to stimulate the brome underneath rather than hurt it. So, um, and question you had it grazed off by, I'm not sure when it was grazed, by what time it was grazed off, uh, it was, it was, grazed off fairly high capacity over a short period of time. And that's what I'd recommend, getting that canopy off so that uh, the underneath grass can start getting the sunlight uh, once you get in the shorter days of fall. Um, then next slide, uh, and, and Doug mentioned animal genetics. And some animals do quite fine on fescue, others do not. One breed of animal that, uh, one breed of cattle that seems to be uh, very tolerant of fescue endophyte is a cinepole or a red pole, which is a composite breed that has a fair percentage of cinepole in it. Uh, cinepole uh, 
uh, originated in the Caribbean islands. Uh, one of the parent breeds was the Nadama breed from Senegal and West Africa. And uh, just has a, a waxy substance that tends to reflect um, infrared light. Uh, so animals don't absorb heat standing out in the sunlight. Uh, they just don't have as high a body temperature on fescue as other breeds. And so, you know, genetic selection, um, it doesn't have to necessarily be this breed. There are animals within every breed that are more tolerant of fescue. And you can select for that over time. And, and whether on purpose or accidentally, producers have done that over time uh, in Missouri. And a lot of times Missouri cattlemen have a train wreck when they bring in good looking cattle from other areas that have never had exposure to fescue. Um, now on the next slide, there are some feed additives that you can add uh, that can help reduce the effects of fescue endophyte. And because the endophyte causes blood vessels to constrict, there are feed additives uh, like kelp is one of them. Uh, kelp can uh, open up the blood vessels. Uh, capsaicin, which is basically chili powder, um, hot pepper extract. Um, the uh, opens up the blood vessels as well, and that's why you sweat when you eat peppers. Um, cinnamon has a similar effect. Um, so there are some some additives that you can add to feed. Um, even willow leaves have been known to open up blood vessels because of the uh, the salicylic acid content in willow leaves. So allowing animals to browse on willows can, can reduce heat stress among animals. And then the next slide, um, there are some plants that we can put into fescue pastures. Red clover is one of the better ones. Um, the uh, red clover contains some isoflavins that um, if you can pronounce that biochainin, uh, you're better than I am, but that is a compound that uh, helps, uh, like the pepper extract, helps open up the blood flow. And there's some other plants that contain varying amounts of this. And, uh, the next slide is white clover, which uh, contains it. And uh, then we have a couple slides of some of the different other clovers that, uh, if you wanna click ahead, Noah, to the other clovers here. And this is what, research has shown of what clovers do. Um, you know, add clover to Kentucky 31, you get four tenths of a pound per day. Replacing the K31 with the novel endophyte uh, version, increased average daily gain by 1.1. And then when you put them to the two together, you got about 90% of the best of, you know, of both of them together. You get a very good additive effect. And so um, adding clover can really help uh, replacing it and then adding clover is better yet. So, um, and other clovers have this same effect. Uh, the next slide is uh, white clover and, or ladino clover. And then uh, we have a new clover, a couple new clovers in our lineup. Uh, Aberlasting is a hybrid between Cura clover and white clover, much deeper rooted, spreads by rhizomes, more productive than white clover. And then the, the next slide is uh, stamina white clover, uh, which is uh, uh, developed to be more heat and drought tolerant than other white clovers. Mark, you wanna jump in and yeah, tell us? Yeah, that's an intermediate uh, white clover. So Basically, the benefits of an intermediate over like a ladino is that uh, you get that stoloniferous, uh, very dense, uh, and you know, in grazing trials uh, that were filmed in Kentucky, I mean, it, it had uh, you know as much uh, persistence and um, you know through multi years of uh, intense grazing as uh, some of the smaller leaf white clovers, and so. The smaller leaf white clovers have the stolen density, larger leaf ladino types, typically very showy, very productive, but um, lack that stolen density. And so in grazing, they, they don't persist as well. 
but uh, it makes a, a nice balance, good combination. Uh, clover works very well with uh, top fescue as, as red clover or alfalfa or whatever legume you want to add. Okay. Yeah. And click on down to the next couple more slides here. So there's stamina. Um, and then the next slide is alfalfa. I think uh, alfalfa is a, a highly underutilized grazing plant. It's the best grazing plant in the world, I like to say, except for a few problems. It, it, it kills your animals and your animals kill that, kill the alfalfa. But other than that, it's great. And of course, bloat is the, the problem with alfalfa. And one of the ways you prevent bloat is by having plants that contain tannin in the mix. And luckily, tannin also will complex with alkaloids, which is the toxins, the toxins in fescue are alkaloids. If you have tannin containing plants in your grazing mix, tannin will, will bind up with that alkaloid and neutralize it. And so your most powerful plants for eliminating fescue toxicity are your tannin containing plants like annual Lespedeza. Uh, the next plant is uh, sandfoin. And then uh, another plant that contains a polyphenol similar to tannin is chicory, which is the next slide. And uh, chicory, uh, we, we've talked several times on here before about the wonders of chicory as the grazing plant, uh, very high in mineral content, anti-parasitic effects, um, also helps neutralize fes fescue toxins. Um, next screen. Are you able to see that, Dale? I don't know if there's a yeah. A line. Okay. Yeah, yeah, and all all this does. We we've, we've talked about a number of these plants are legumes, and this picture is just uh, to the left. Is an, I know it's really blurry. To the left is alfalfa, a plot of alfalfa. To the right is a plot of orchard grass. And look at how vigorous the orchard grass is where the fescue and the grass overlap. This, this just shows how much benefit to overall productivity legumes can have. And you know, a lot of people don't put legumes in with their grasses. One reason is because they feel they have to spray for weeds. And I think what you know, Doug's experience says that if you are rotationally grazing and moving on a daily basis, cows will eat almost all the weeds you have. You really don't need chemical weed control. Now, this is what I call my fescue fixing mix. This is a, a list of plants that I like to put into fescue pastures as sort of renovation. Um, and uh, each of these plants in here has beneficial effects somehow. The bird's foot trefoil is also a tannin containing legume. You know, the, there's, there's the isoflavones, there's the tannins, there's the, the summer productivity of the crabgrass and teff. Every plant in here has a purpose. Let's go on the next slide. Um, if you're not getting a good stand of clover, I'd say one reason is you're applying nitrogen. Uh, you should not be applying nitrogen if you're trying to get clover established. Too much nitrogen, it doesn't nodulate and won't compete. Another problem, next slide, is, uh, is pH. If you've been applying nitrogen fertilizer, nitrogen fertilizer creates soil acidity. Uh, each pound of nitrogen creates a need for two pounds of lime and it's still there in the soil. And it's all concentrated in the surface where clover seeds are trying to germinate. So uh, you might take a one inch soil sample, test for acidity if you're having problems getting clover established. And then the third reason that I find this is probably the most common in my experience is crickets. Uh, I've seen crickets completely wipe out seedlings of, of alfalfa, seedlings of clover, seedlings of, of uh, 
all different kinds of legumes. Uh, they are abundant in grasses, uh, but as soon as they get something with higher protein than grass, like a legume seedling, they'll nail it. And so the next slide. Dale, we got about, about four minutes left, so I don't know okay. what you want to hit on, but. Okay, let's talk about killing and replacing. Of course, you maintain, let's, let's kind of just start clicking through. Uh, okay. kind of slow and I'll, I'll speed her up here. Okay. Okay, the next step is let's kill alfalfa or let's kill the fescue out. And before you kill the alfalfa or the, kill the alfalfa, kill the fescue out. I've had too many alfalfa phone calls today. Uh, eliminating seed production on the fescue uh, can be very valuable. And then after you uh, prevent seed production, next slide, basically spray with glyphosate. Now you can spray with glyphosate or you can till it. Um, I prefer the glyphosate. It's going to break down over time. Uh, it's hard for the soil to move back uphill. After you spray it out, plant an annual crop, and then you spray again. And uh, official, official recommendations are to do this for one summer. And I think that is completely inadequate. I think in order to get rid of fescue, you really need to not spray, smother, spray. I think you need to spray, smother, smother, spray, smother. You need to do it two years, however many sprays and smothers that is. And in that two years, you can fit in four crops of summer annuals just like this. And you can see this is in the heat of summer. This is probably August right here. And you compare this to what a typical fescue pasture looks like. People's objection, main objection to replacing their fescue is, well, you know, I can't afford to be without X percentage of my pasture each year. You're not during this conversion process. Your productivity will likely go up and go up dramatically. It's not unusual to get 300 pounds of gain an acre in just a couple months off a summer annual pasture like this. So if you can go out and for two years plant a rotation of warm season annuals with like this cool season annuals, you can see the sorghum regrowth in this. This is uh, oats, um, ryegrass, and uh, triticale um, all mixed together. And for a, this was drilled right into grazed off sorghum sedan stubble, summer annuals like what we saw. And this comes back and, and this can be grazed in October, November, December. Uh, this picture was taken in the uh, last week of September. When you do the replacement, you know, what do you, after you kill the fescue, you've gone through this two year process of planting annuals, um, I recommend doing about 20% of your, your acreage each year. Start with the annuals, and then after two years of annuals, then start replanting. What do you replant? Um, one option would be novel fescue. Another option would be warm season grass. And we've got some pictures coming up of different warm season grass possibilities. And uh, there's uh, some of Doug's big blue stem. It, look at that beautiful stand, a big blue stem. And I mean, this is in the heat of summer. Uh, and why do we recommend warm season grasses? Um, warm season grasses have some really good, I don't like it as 100% of your acreage, but I do like it definitely as part of your acreage or part of your mix. And the next slide is actually my favorite pasture grass. That's Eastern Gamma grass. And this is a field behind my, my house at one time. Um, this was established on former cropland. And you can see just how pro productive this was. And just to show you why I like warm season grasses so much, click onto the next slide. Oh, and this is gamma grass actually being established at the same time they're growing a corn crop. So, um, just splitting the row middles with gamma grass and getting it off. You don't necessarily have to let it sit out of here. One secret, you know, people say it takes three years to establish warm season grasses. Not necessarily. Um, you can see the line right down the center of this slide. To the left of that, that was gamma grass inoculated with mycorrhizal fungi. 
to the right, you see that six foot strip of nothing but cheatgrass? That gamma grass was not inoculated with mycorrhizal fungi. It was all planted at the same time. Uh, the mycorrhizal fungi really makes a big, big difference in grass establishment, in warm season grass establishment. And one of the advantages of warm season grass on the next slide, and uh, I took this slide and the next slide on the very same day. This is orchard grass pasture. This was taken in June of 2018 during our 13 month drought with 12 inches of rain. Um, Dale, Dale, I hate I hate to cut you off, but I also want to make sure that we get to, to some questions. Yeah, I think I've got two slides. Okay. So, but anyhow, this is uh, the hit the next couple slides here fairly quickly. Basically, if you look at uh, the bottom line on having a rotation between warm season and cool season, uh, the pounds of gain that you can get per acre. Um, by having that seasonal rotation or a mixture of the two plants within the same pasture um, can really increase. If you look at 250 versus 450 pounds of beef, if you can get 200 additional pounds of beef per acre every single year, that makes that conversion process really easy to swallow. And during the conversion process, if you can seed clovers, legumes, other things into your existing fescue as you're converting this pasture slowly over, then eventually, I mean, this process doesn't take two years before you make money. You make money during the conversion process. And I think that's what a lot of people don't understand is there is an immediate payback to this. And got a couple slides here on Estancia and there's my books there if anybody's interested. So guys, Mark, Doug, uh, questions? Noah, you wanna, you want me to answer questions as they come on the screen or? Yeah, so I think at this point um, we will open it up. Um, there was a question here from Dean that said, how did the brown grass come back after the summer? I think you had answered that one. Mm -hmm. Um, Tucker Griffiths said, would planting a novel into fight fescue along with little blue stem and crabgrass be a good idea? It, did, did you address that at all? Uh, no, not really. Um, and we're all products of our own experience. In, in my experience, end of fight fescue basically takes over warm season grasses and you end up with solid fescue over time. Almost all my experience has been starting with good native grass and the fescue moved in. And it was into fight fescue under completely unmanaged grazing, just continuous grazing. Uh, Doug, I know you have some different experiences um, on managing a balance. You wanna explain a little bit on, on keeping a balance of, of warm and cool season species and how that can be accomplished? Yeah. Um... You know, I don't think there's any doubt that that um, I would prefer a, a, a very diverse mixture, you know, of both warm and cool. Um, it, it is going to take some some pretty good management, you know. And so, unless somebody had a, a a really good management system in place or was willing to really do a lot of rotating, I probably wouldn't necessarily recommend a, a diverse, you know, cool and warm mix to everybody. Um, so it kind of depends on their management level. But, but for example, um, the last conversion I did, um, seeded it a year and a half ago, was 70 acres of, it was a 50 species mix. And it had native cool seasons in it. Um, Virginia rye, uh, Canada, Canada rye, several others, uh, river oats. Um, it also had native warm seasons like um, Eastern Gamma that Dale mentioned. I love Eastern Gamma, Big Blue, Indian had a little bit of little blue for us. Little blue is not a huge, a huge component of our prairies in Missouri, but um, I know Tucker had, had asked about it specifically. He's from Southwest Oklahoma. Um, so so I, I'm a believer in mixtures, um, but, but it's gonna take really good management. Um, and so, 
Um, I think I think if, if we talk about our soil health principles, you know, diversity is one of our one of our primary soil health principles. And um, I just I don't think we can we can overstate the importance of diversity. It, it, it's tougher management, no no doubt about it. Monocultures, single, more simple mixtures are easier to manage in the short term, but but long term from a soil uh, regeneration standpoint, um, I think that diverse mixtures are are a little more beneficial. Yeah, if you have warm season grasses and you're concerned about cool season taking over, um, late April burning will retard those cool season grasses. Um, if all else fails, uh, also grazing very heavily in May and June will shift more towards warm season. Yep. Um, and, and if off the big guns, you can hit it with Roundup in November after the warm seasons have already, you know, gone dormant and take out fescue then. Roundup or clethodim, if you really want to pull out the chemical guns. Um, if you want more cool season component and less warm season, um, graze hard in September and put out nitrogen fertilizer or a lot of legumes. Nitrogen, warm season grasses need less nitrogen than cool season grasses. So if you shift the nitrogen fertility, you can shift the competitive balance between cool and warm season. Uh, continuous grazing though, you will tend to get monocultures of the least palatable plant in the stand. Yep. And oftentimes that's endified fescue. Yep, so I would agree. Do not plant a blend if you're going to continuous graze. I'd agree. You're going that's, to get the least palatable of that to take over. Yeah, that's why that's why your recommendation has to has to evaluate their management level and their management skill. Mark, did you have something to add there? You know, I, I was going to say, yeah, we talk a lot about warm season and cool season, but there's also the difference between native grasses and introduced or um, you know improved grasses. And so, typically, yes. our introduced grasses are going to be a little higher in inputs. Uh, they can tolerate more abuses. Uh, versus what you can do with, um, you know, typically your native grasses require fewer inputs, uh, which is beauty of native grasses, but they, they don't tolerate uh, some of the abuses that, that you can get away with when you're talking about Bermuda grass and tall fescue. Yeah. So I just wanted to make that differentiation there that, yeah, there's a difference between warm season and cool season, annuals, perennials, but also a big difference between natives and introduced grasses. Yeah, uh, few things tolerate abuse as well as Bermuda grass and tall fescue. And that's why they're the two most popular pasture grasses in the United States. Because most people abuse their pastures. I and mean, that's just being honest. So Carol's asking, can you oversee Bermuda with gamma grass? Uh, any of you guys? have any experience doing that? Uh, I, I'd be pretty doubtful that you'd have much success with that. The gamma grass um, does not like early season. You're talking about interceding a warm season into a warm season. So they've got the gamma grass is going to be at a big competitive disadvantage against the Bermuda. It's also a lot more palatable. And so animals are going to take the gamma grass out um, if you want gamma grass instead of Bermuda grass, I, I would say you probably need to do a complete conversion in that case or establish gamma grass in a separate pasture. Uh, I could be wrong. I've, I've seen gamma grass come up in a lot of situations. I would have never expected it. I've seen it volunteering in the form. Of, I've seen cattle eat the seed heads and then the next paddock they move into gamma grass comes up everywhere. So I'm not going to say it, it can't be done, but I'd be hesitant to spend a lot of money. Gamma grass seed is expensive, really expensive. And I, I don't want to throw, I'm never going to recommend someone throw it out in a situation with a low probability of success. And, you know, Dale, that kind of comes back to what I was trying to point out is that, you know, the way I utilize native grasses is that, you know, I, I'm, you know, I, hard, but, you know, I'm very um, conscientious about how much pressure I put on and how long I put that pressure 
um, you know, how long I let them rest, recover, uh, versus a Bermuda grass. So, mm -hmm. I mean, because if you have Bermuda grass, I mean, it is Bermuda grass. When you establish Bermuda grass, you signed a lifelong contract with the fertilizer company. Yep. That's what worked. It can <laughs> yeah. We park animals over there and you can, um, you know, abuse it. But, you know, hey, when you get the rainfall, you fertilize it. I mean, it, it's going to fix itself. And so, yeah, typically when you start kind of mixing those grasses, you're almost, um, you're almost better off to say, you know what, I'm going to set aside some acres on the farm that can be almost sacrifice acres so that I can go park cattle on it, you know, for a period of time if I need to. And those are your Bermuda grass acres versus what you're going to do with some of your other grasses. Yeah. Yeah. So that kind of goes, Michael uh, asked a question, what percent of warm season grasses would you recommend? 20 to 30% total acres? I, I think it depends on where, where you're located. Um, you know, if, if you're in the corn belt, I think that, and, and Doug, you're in the corn belt. So correct me if I'm wrong here. I like to see a third of your acres and, and some of it depends on whether you want to have year round grazing or not. Um, the, uh, you know, in the corn belt, a, a reseeded native grass stand is going to be far more productive than a wild native grass stand in the Flint Hills of Kansas. And that's not because the grasses are different, but uh, the soil is different. I mean, wild native grass exists because that soil was too rocky, too shallow, too something to plow. Now, if you're taking good Iowa crop ground and putting it back to native grass, it might produce five or six times the biomass of native grass field in central Kansas or the Nebraska sand hills or someplace like that. And in, in my area, the most productive ground is farm ground, and that's what gets planted to cool season grasses. So we have this perception that cool season grasses are more productive than our native grass. And they are, it's not the grass, it's the soil that they're put on. Now, if you go to uh, Missouri, where you've got fescue growing on all the rocky and rough pasture and the cropland, if you take cropland, put it to warm season grass, it might completely blow away productivity of, of the fescue pastures because it's on better soil. And so it, it's hard to make a blanket statement of that until you know what the soil productivity is that you're putting each of those on. But in general, warm season grasses need less water, less nitrogen. Uh, it can be more productive on less water and less nitrogen than the cool season grasses. Um, but they have a shorter growing season. Uh, warm season grass might produce 200 pounds a day in mid-July per acre. Cool season grass may be 80, uh, but it does it for a short period of time, whereas the cool season grasses uh, might be might have an eight-month growing season instead of a four or five. So it's it's a, a lot of it depends on the season, but in general, I like. Uh, if I'm in the corn belt, I like about a third warm season, two thirds cool season. And that's enough to get you, because you're grazing the warm season for about four months and the cool season for about eight. Doug, you're, you're up there. What well, you yeah, one of the things that I guess that I have kind of kind of changed my opinion a little bit on is, is, is that percentage. I, I think we can get by, particularly if we're talking to a cow calf operation, I think we can get by on a much higher percentage of native of warm season than that. Um, and, and here's why, you know, we, we, we know that, you know, some of our cool season grasses are, are way, way too high in protein for our, for beef cows. Okay. Now, you know, stalkers, um, it's a whole different, whole different ball game, but, but particularly for our beef cows, we've got probably a lot of excess protein for a substantial part of the year. And that causes, I think, quite a few health issues. And so that's where we can come in with, with e even during that fall and winter, you mentioned earlier that, that fescue can have a really high protein even in the winter. Um, and so it doesn't take very much cool season grass mixed in with some of those dormant native warm seasons 
to provide enough protein to digest those those warm season grasses. Um, mm -hmm. You know, that's is, is exactly what they do in the West is is provide a protein supplement to to digest the dormant uh, native rangeland, the native warm season rangeland. We can do it back here in in our part of the world simply by growing a cool season component to that to that mixture of native warm seasons. Um, yeah. Let those animals um, select their own select their own protein to go along with that dormant warm season grass. And I think yeah. we've got several examples of people doing that. Um, and 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 so basically, if you can do that, then it comes down to which which ones are going to produce more volume. Um, most, most all of the stuff that I've seen in RCS is stuff um, shows that, that, that the natives on a per year basis will, the, the, the warm seasons, big blue Indian, uh, Eastern gamma that you mentioned, will for the most part on a, on a particular soil type will produce more pounds per acre than any of the cool seasons. It's, it's, a, it's a much narrower growing season. Uh -huh. That's where we have to learn to to graze those dormant forages throughout the year, not just when they're green. And I yeah. think that's a that's one of the tricks to 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 spreading that use out over the year. Um, again, it does depend. You know, I, I wouldn't expect to 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 get the performance of stalkers on something right. like, that. Um, but it's just yeah. a, a different trick to it. Um. Yeah. And, you know, and Dale, one of the things that I, you know, is picking up on as he's talking about you, we always talk about how the, the grasslands were formed with these, you know, herds of bison that would move mm -hmm. up grazing intensely on these native grasses all the way from, you know, Texas to the Dakotas. And so how that, how that was developed. But, uh, you know, so when you break that down on a, on a farm basis, you know, it's kind of, uh, you can rotate those animals around, but I mean, you still have yep. seasons of the year where you have animals still stuck on that same property. So you, that's the reason why this implementation of cool season grasses, warm season grasses, uh, annuals, uh, you know, annual rotations of winter, you know, warm and cool season grasses seems to work because, you know, we have fences. So those animals, they don't leave the farm. I mean, if we're running a stalker operation mm -hmm. and that kind of thing, you know, that's when those animals are there for a set time and then you can move them off. Well, if you're, you know, or cow calf or extending beyond a cow calf where you're keeping those animals on the farm for a longer period, so you have different classes of animals, you have different nutritional requirements, that's when it starts to make a lot of sense to have those, you know, warm season perennials. Uh, those cool season perennials, those uh, warm, uh, you know, warm and cool, uh, you know, annual rot you know, rotations versus, mm -hmm. just, you know, this is my farm and we have this kind of grass. Yeah. And I think, uh, you know, like Mark, you raised grass finished beef and one of the real bottlenecks in raising grass finished beef is having a high quality pasture source available in midwinter. And novel endophyte tall fescue is that. I don't know any other grass that can touch the quality in the dead of winter in this latitude, this Kansas, Nebraska, even into Oklahoma, the high quality of stockpiled novel endophyte tall fescue. And that's uh, one of the things that you were speaking about earlier is that it, it, you know, there's the days of grazing. How many days, how many days of grazing do you that plant. Yes, it does have a summer slump. You do have that, um, you know, dead of winter slump, but you know, it, it's, it's not like it goes completely dormant during the winter. And that's why mm -hmm. the quality of stockpiled tall fescue is so good in the winter versus mm -hmm. completely dormant uh, because, you know, your warm season are going to go completely dormant during the winter. And yeah. so, some of your nutritional requirements can be pretty high during that period of time. And that's the reason why it's important to have that as part of the, as part of the mix. Yeah. And, and I have, uh, in the past, I have weaned my calves in December and the calves go on to stockpile and uh, novel endophyte fescue and the cows go back on to dormant native range. Cause that's the, the, yeah. the, the cheapest 
bulk feed I can find for a dry cow in midwinter is dormant native range with a little bit of protein in it. And, and like Doug said, if you can, you, there's two ways to provide protein. You can buy it and bring it, or you can grow it right in mixed with the other grass. So I like, I like, like Doug said, having that cool season component with the warm season dominance and, and then having a separate pasture where I can, and on the cool season dominant pasture, I can use my summer annuals uh, while my entire herd is on the warm season from May to, whether it's warm season annuals or perennials, May to first of September, I can be stockpiling uh, crabgrass or teff or sun hemp or cowpeas or sorghum sedan for use in September when I pull off of that native. I've got a huge accumulated volume there that they can go into and, and extend my fall grazing period out considerably. Yeah. Well, that was all great information. Um, there's definitely a few questions here that we did not get to. If you guys have those questions, feel free to email them uh, either to Dale, and that's uh, dale at greencoverseed.com, or if it's a question for Mark or Doug, you can email myself. That's Noah, N-O-A-H, at greencoverseed.com. We'll get those dispersed to those guys. Um, I guess real quick before we go, is there anything that we did not touch on from any of our panelists here? Do you guys have any final thoughts? Okay. Well, with that, we will probably conclude here. Thank you guys so much for being a part of this, um, for taking the time out of your day to help us out and share your knowledge and expertise. Next week, we're going to have Dale back. He's going to be talking about winter stockpile mixes. So excited to see that. You kind of got a teaser of that already with the, the native side of things, but we'll probably be talking about annuals specifically. So Thank you guys very much. Again, if you've got those questions, you can email them to Dale at Green Cover Seed or Noah at Green Cover Seed. Thank you guys, and we'll see you all next week. Thanks, Doug. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. Thank you, guys.